Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that introduction. Way, way over, overboard. Uh, I want to thank everybody, and, and I'm so great to see so many people that I know, and of course, uh, so many friends. I hope you're all members of the Historical Society. Uh, I also want to introduce my daughter, Alicia, who's here tonight, the youngest person in our group. <laughs> Alicia is a freshman this year at Stanford, so here she is taking another class. So since the completion of the founding grant in 1895, Jane and Leland Stanford found that physical activity is valuable for its own sake and that vigorous exercise is complementary to the educational purposes of the university. A mere one month and two days after the opening of Stanford, an athletic association was formed on November 3rd, 1891. It was quickly replaced by the Stanford Athletic Association, but this was really the beginning of Stanford Athletics. Only 23 years later, the European War started in July of 1914. The athletic teams at Stanford came into difficult times during that war. The teams were under faculty supervision but under student management. Interest in sports was at a, at a low ebb and just about out of funds. The Board of Athletic Control was formed by the university on February 5th of 1917. And they inherited a great deal of equipment, but also a great deal of debt, and had the job to restructure from the bottom up. At that time, athletic competition from the University of California was almost suspended. Back then, rugby was the outstanding sport, and the University of Santa Clara, as it was called then, was the most important opponent. Interest in rowing as an intercollegiate sport had grown up, but was dormant. Equipment was poor, money was hard to find, and, and the rowing on the bay was difficult. At the time, a $15,000 loan from the Board of Trustees, which is, by the way, $325,000 today, was arranged to pay for all of those outstanding bills. Anticipated income from all sources for Stanford Athletics that year was about $200,000, which is about $433,000 in today's dollar. Minor sports were undeveloped for men. There was one track, one football field, and one small gymnasium. Since 1892, the Encina Gymnasium was home to men's indoor sports. Plans to replace the structure were almost complete in 1906. But on, April, but on uh, but April 18th, the earthquake happened and down went the building. However, nine years later, the new Encina Gymnasium opened up on September 1st, 1915 a new center for men's sports. It had over 49,000 square feet and cost at the time $196,000, which is just over $5 million in today's dollars. Designed by the San Francisco architectural firm of Bakewell and Brown, which also designed over 26 other buildings on campus. The main drill floor had space for a basketball court with only five feet on each side and 11 feet on each end, and also had plenty of space on that same drill floor for indoor baseball. <laughs> there was a small swimming pool built in 1915, but soon replaced with three new swimming pools about the same location in 1929. Those pools were recently dug out during the construction of the new Arriaga Hall. Believe it or not, all those pools were still under there. Arriaga Hall is going to house the athletic academic area, some rowing facilities, dry land rowing, and our new Be Well program. With the completion of Encina Gym and Pool, things started to look up for sports again at Stanford University in, in late 1915. After 80 years in use of this building, the athletic department vacated Encina Gymnasium 
and it was turned into storage and then demolished in 2000, 2004 to make way for the Arriaga Family Arriaga Center for Sports and Recreation on the exact same site. However, on April 6, 1917, the United States joined its allies, Britain, France, and Russia, to fight the European War, which then was known as the Great War. Under the command of General John J. Pershing, more than two million U.S. soldiers fought in the battlefields of Europe. After the U.S. entered the war, the Student Army Training Corps was organized on the campus in 1917. Arrangements for all sports were turned over to the commanding officer, Captain Samuel Parker. Half of the students enrolled at Stanford enrolled in the training corps. Encina and Sequoia Halls were turned over to the Army for barracks, and some courses at Stanford were added, and others were dropped. Sports and social activities were suspended and the community settled down to the task of winning the war. To make matters worse, in September of 1918, the influenza epidemic swept through the country. Over 250 cases alone were on the Stanford campus. During the war, the student enrollment was about 2,221 students, and only 143 were women, and the academic council then was 125. Today, the tablets at Memorial Auditorium list 77 faculty, alumni, and students who lost their lives during that war. But on November 11, 1918, the armistice was signed. With the return of the faculty and the students, things started to get back to normal on campus again. In the spring of 1919, sports at Stanford were resumed under the Board of Athletic Control. Negotiations were taken up with the University of California, but at the time, rugby was an official sport at Cal, and, and, and or rugby was the official sport at Stanford, and the American football game was being played at Cal. 1919 brought considerable reorganization to the Department of Physical Training. Stanford Athletics, as it was called then, had to be remolded to use business methods of administration. The Faculty Athletic Committee, whose members were appointed by the president of the faculty from the faculty, determined the general policy. And the second side of that was the Board of Athletic Control, consisting of three faculty members appointed by the president, three alums chosen from the alumni executive committee, and three students select, elected by the general population of students. The Committee of Nine was the administrative body that arranged for schedules and budgeting and the selection of staff members, all to be appointed from the president. The Board of Athletic Control also employed a manager that oversaw the major sports of football, basketball, baseball, rowing, and track. The president appointed a director of the Department of Physical Training who had control over all divisions of the department. He was also a member of the Board of Athletic Control. He was chairman of the Faculty Athletic Committee and the Faculty Athletic Representative to the Pacific Coast Intercollegiate Conference that year. The organization's mission was to give opportunity to enter every form of activity to receive all the social, physical, moral advantages resulting from physical training. Facilities at the time included Angel Field and Stanford Field. Angel Field, as you can see, is the oval, which is exactly where Cobb Track and Angel Field is today. And Stanford Field, the 15,000 seat football stadium, is right about where the track we're right about where the tennis facility is today. Another, another look at part of Palo Alto, and you can barely see the little oval track and the football stadium. 
1919, the 1920 season only showed one victory for the Cardinal varsity over the blue and gold. The Cardinal, however, gave everything they had to beat the teams from Berkeley. After a 14-year absence, American football returned to the campus for the 1919 season. Stanford President Ray Lyman Wilbur approved the plans for the Athletic Board of Control to bring back the game of football for the first time since 1905. While President Wilbur and President Wheeling from the University of California were in negotiations about the return of football, it was decided that these games would be resumed through the Pacific Coast Intercollegiate Association. MC Melbourne Covell Bob Evans, as he was called Bob, was relatively unknown. He was selected to be the team's head coach. He served as the head football coach at the University of Colorado in Boulder in 1916 and 1917. Evans was also the head basketball coach at Colorado in 1917 and 1918 and the head baseball coach at Colorado in 1918 before taking, before becoming the Stanford football coach in 1919. He was our basketball coach in 1918 through 1920 and since he knew how to coach baseball was also the baseball coach in 1919 and 1920. With the end of the Great World War and Stanford's 14-year absence from football, the 1919 season was looked upon with great anticipation. Stanford football started in the spring season of that year, in the later part of May and the early part of June, and over 60 students turned out, and a similar number turned out for the fall camp. In 1919, Stanford played men at the USS Boston, they played the Olympic Club, they played Oregon Agricultural College, St. Mary's, and Santa Clara. The rugby stars Danny Carroll and Ding Templeton made a successful transition to football to help spark the spirit of football back to the Stanford campus. Stanford enthusiasm ran rampant at the return of the annual football rally two days before the football game with California. The students unanimously voted with the, up to their opinion of the team. When the coach and the team marched into the tune of Believe It or Not, Come Join the Band, a hundred years ago, the evening's enthusiasm rose to a level unknown by the student body. The inside rally then adjourned to the huge pile of timbers with a little model of a Campanelli on the top that the freshmen, not for you, Alicia, had been working on assembling all week. As the crowds assembled, it was soon a mass of flames. Not only did the student body enjoy the pep rally, but the reports say thousands of others from off campus came to witness the blaze. Although there was a game and many of you may know this, there was a game that American football played on November 28th, 1918, that was really of little consequence. Under the direction of the coach, Officer Captain Samuel Parker, a game of American football was played between the Army unit at Stanford and a student unit, unit at Berkeley in the fall of 1918 at California Field. In fact, right there, there's a game program to the left but it was never accepted into the record books and has basically faded from history. The first official game between the two universities took place on November 22nd, 1919 as the 25th big game. But before the game, a cross country race was held between Stanford and Cal. It started and finished at Stanford Field. The annual cross-country race had not taken place since 2017 before the war and was a great event in preparing the track team for the spring. Between the halves of the game, a special engagement of the Alcatraz Prison School <laughs> versus the Milpitas Night School in a game of American football. The crowd loved the halftime entertainment, but no score was ever recorded. 
Stanford lost to Cal that afternoon, 14 to zero, but it was the first big game since 1914 when the schools played rugby and the first big game of football since Stanford's 12 to five victory in 1905, which was, by the way, played on the first game ever played at Stanford Field. In fine tradition of the day, after the game, a vaudeville show at a Stanford Assembly Hall and a dance at the Stanford Gymnasium was held for all. Stanford Assembly Hall was building now, building 120. It was built in 1898 and in 1937 dismantled and put, uh, made into the Stanford Law School. Stanford Field was actually the second football stadium on the Stanford campus. It served as home field for the Stanford football and rugby teams, soccer teams, women teams, women's teams, and others from 1905 to the first part of the 1921 season. It had a capacity of 15,000. Again, there's the map. Today, today that site holds the Varsity Tennis, Toby Family Tennis Stadium. The team ended the season four and three. Stanford had a new coach in 1920, had a new coach in 1921, until it hired two-year head coach Andy Kerr. Then, after that, nine-year head coach Pop Warner started 1924. During the following, during the years following 1919, football was the main concern of the Board of Athletic Control. It was very important since football had a larger following than any other sport and produced all the income needed to develop and support all of the others. A very similar story still exists today. The Stanford Five made history in 1919 and 1920 season. Previous to the war, the Cardinal had never been strong in the Pacific Coast circles and was never considered a serious candidate, in fact, until this year. Stanford, till this year, Stanford had not won a basketball game against Cal since the team gained the status of a major sport. Stanford this year only lost one game to Washington State College. Stanford won the Pacific Coast Conference with a record of nine and one that year. Second place went to Cal with a record of five and five. Washington State College, Oregon Agricultural College, Washington and Oregon were all in the PCC at the time. It was noted that even though the gymnasium was only a few years old, it was entirely inadequate to hold the crowds who wanted to attend the intercollegiate games, even though the Encina Gym was just a few years old. In the Nevada, California Nevada League, Stanford finished second and ended the season with ended the season at 12 and 3. The kids were so interested this year that there was also a freshman team. And freshmen at that time earned a, a, a block eight numeral award, is what it was called. Again, the basketball coach that year was Bob Evans and coaching all of those sports. <laughs> this year was the first year Stanford baseball entered the PCC. There were 13 games that filled the preseason. Stanford's home diamond was, same as the football stadium, Stanford Field and it would be several years before the team had their own first diamond located where the Avery Aquatic Center is today. Stanford ended the season 10 and 11 record, five and five in the PCC and placing fourth place. Again, our friend Bob Evans was the baseball coach <laughs> and he had to actually start late that year because the basketball team kept going in postseason. <laughs> Stanford also fielded a freshman nine. Starting out the track season with the smallest squad 
in the history of Stanford, and with an even smaller number of stars, Stanford was forced to go up against the best balanced track team California had in over 10 years. The 1920 track season was a steady uphill fight for the Cardinal. Dink Templeton, a name a lot of us know, attended Palo Alto High School and attended Stanford University, where he played football and on the rugby union teams as well as the track team. He received both his undergraduate degree and law degree from Stanford. That year, Stanford won all four of the preliminary meets, beating the Redland Pomona twice and beating USC twice. During the regular season, Stanford didn't win a single meet. But in 1922, Dink came back and returned to Stanford as our track coach, a position that he held in 1939. His brother, two years before that, was also the track coach at Stanford for two years. During his tenure, Stanford won the NCAA Men's Track and Field Championship in 1925, 1928, 1934, and Stanford athletes won 19 individual titles. He was noted at the time for conducting intensive daily practices, an uncommon practice at the time. Today, we honor Dink Templeton and his wife Kathy with a plaza at the Cobb Track and Angel Field on near campus track. For the first time, even during the war, it was doubtful that if crew could continue as a sport at Stanford in 1919 and the spring of 1920. However, a surplus from the football season was voted on by the student body to be used for crew. And a coaching launch and other equipment were purchased and practice started in the winter quarter. Lack of water in Lagunita prevented that early season to work out to be done. So Les Rogers, class of 17, a member of the famous Poughkeepsie crew, was chosen as the head coach and work began on the bay in Redwood. As has always been the case with crew, they worked under certain difficulties. <clears throat> coach Rogers could only make it to the bay on the weekends. It wasn't clear what he did the rest of the week. And the surplus football receipts did not materialize into the large amount that was expected. But the old shells worked out just fine. Stanford lost that year the regatta, losing to California in all the races. Crew was important to the students at Stanford up until 1918, as Stanford had beat California 10 straight years. The minor sports. Minor sports at Stanford, as they were called then, included rugby, soccer, boxing, wrestling, swimming and diving, and polo. Although the game of rugby took place, took the place of American football from 1906 to 1918, in 1919, it became a minor sport. Rugby was still played on campus with the possibility of continuing, contributing some of the players to the California Rugby 15 to complete, compete in the 1920 Olympics. Morris Curtsy was our star player and went on to the 1920 Olympics. And we'll visit about that in just a bit more. Two weeks after the big game, Cal and Stanford faced off in rugby. Its diminished status confirmed by the fact that the game was a double header with the soccer teams. The fighting spirit was still there, one reporter noted. The crowds were not. Only a small section of bleachers, as shown in this picture, was occupied by supporters of the two teams. Football was king again. The Cardinal soccer team made an excellent showing after the war. They won six, lost two, and tied two. The losses came from California and the Olympic Club, 
both of which Stanford beat earlier in the season. Henry Wilfred Maloney, Harry as he liked to be called, first came to Stanford in 1908. He coached the soccer program from 1912 to 1943. He was also the head coach of six sports for an aggregate of 70 seasons coaching at Stanford. In addition to being the head coach of soccer for the 29 years, he was also the head coach of fencing for 22 years, boxing for 19 years, and of course he was also coached track, wrestling, and rugby. Coach Maloney's first love was minor sports, as they again were called in that era, and served as the director of minor sports and athletic trainer during his tenure. Harry was quite famous for coaching of the American track team to victory in the inter-allied meet in Paris and, then, and, and was appointed head coach along with another Stanford coach, Dad Moulton, as his assistant. Today, the varsity soccer field and lacrosse field is named Maloney Field at Kagan Stadium. The sport of boxing at Stanford that year lost six out of the seven bouts with Cal. Most of the matches were close, three of them requiring extra rounds. There was only one other match of the year and that was held at USC with each team winning two matches. The biggest development of boxing that year was the change from a second class sport, from a second class, excuse me, second class minor sport to a first class minor sport. This meant that everybody competing against Cal received the Circle S Award. Before, as a second class minor sport, only the win winners received the award. The 1919-1920 wrestling season promised to be victorious on all competitions. Soon the best wrestlers became ineligible. So the rest of the team and some new members of the team worked hard and were developed to take the place of those on probation. The match with California, Stanford won three out of five. Besides the meets, the wrestling team also gave several exhibitions that year at Smokers on campus and in Palo Alto. The new open air wrestling mats constructed in the back of Encina Gym can be seen right under the, these guys have aided in the development of the Stanford team immensely. Swimming proved to be the most successful minor sport during this year. Both the varsity and the freshman squads defeated the blue and gold opponents besides making a fair showing against, another, against other aquatic clubs around the bay and against USC. During the spring break, the swimmers met in the LA Athletic Club and the San Diego Rowing Club. Stanford lost both teams, but again, made a great showing. A lot of credit that year needed to be given to Coach Branston. The Cardinal coach was once a champion diver of the world, and the teams continued to get better and better. Coach Branston was the coach of the swimming and diving and the water polo teams. On that same night as the varsity beat Cal 56 to 22 at the Olympic Club pool, the Stanford varsity water polo players, many of whom were on the swimming team, beat Cal by a score of 14 to two. Stanford lost six out of seven matches against California in tennis but revived re its standing by making a clean sweep in the Ojai Valley Classic. Besides defeating the blue and gold racket wielders, one over the players from USC, Pomona College, Thrope College, now Caltech, and Occidental College. Commencing with the new year, a radical change was introduced at Stanford in connection with athletics. The local societies and fraternities were organized into competing sections. Intramurals, 
as it was called then, had the purpose of providing competitive athletics to those who were unable to make a varsity team and to develop talent in athletics from which the varsity men could be selected. The sports to which this plan was adapted this year was basketball and baseball. Track was planned to be added in the 1920 and 21 season, and the plan was to eventually include all sports at Stanford. <coughs> Women's athletics entered a new era after the war. They were placed on firm financial footing by placing 50% of every dollar the female students paid in support of all the sports went to the women's sports. The control of women's athletics was in the hands of the Women's Athletic Association and the faculty committee on women's athletics corresponding to the, to the control of the men's athletics. The association was made up of one of each of the faculty representatives graduate representatives, freshmen, sophomore, junior, and senior representatives, and the manager of each sport of hockey, swimming, tennis, basketball, fencing, and crew, plus a president, a vice president, and a secretary treasurer. In the fall of 1919, 350 women were participating in some form of athletics or dance at Stanford. And this is an incredible number considering that only 143 women were enrolled at Stanford during the war and the enrollment went up to 500 right after the war. According to the Stanford Quad, the outlook for the future growth and development of women's athletics at Stanford was most encouraging. The main venue for women's sports was Robley Gymnasium, which was completed in 1891. The new Robley Gymnasium on Santa Teresa was still 12 years away and not completed until 1931. This gymnasium was located in almost the exact center of the SEQ courtyard today. The main event of the hockey season, not called field hockey yet, were games played by the sophomore and senior teams with California on Stanford Field. The sophomores won and the seniors lost. The game with Mills College was canceled due to the start of the rainy season. Intramurals included games between all of the classes. Many fast games characterized the season, brought several stars into prominence. Those hockey players included Esther Clark, class of 1921, who participated in the intercollegiate tournament. Esther went on to become a beloved pediatrician who helped thousands of Palo Alto mothers raise healthy children. Dr. Clark, Dr. Clark grew up in College Terrace along with her brothers, Birch and David, and she began her medical career at the Peninsula first, Peninsula's first female pediatrician in 1926. In 1965, Dr. Clark donated uh, land in the city of Palo Alto, 21 acres of her property in the Old Trace and the Old Adobe Roads area. That land is now Esther Clark Nature Preserve. Although limited by having only one shell for practice and no coach, and that Lagunita was slow to fill that year, the women formed a class and a varsity crews, which participated in field day sports. Over 130 women signed up for crew, and practices were held daily. Basketball was a winter sport, played in January and February and March. Four weeks of training, with one regular practice a week, prepared them for the team class teams for the intramural contests which took place for the rest of the quarter. Following the intramural contests, an all-star team was chosen to represent Stanford with colleges around the Bay Area. The intercollegiate schedule was arranged in March. There was difficulty in arranging those games back then, and the only games in 1920 were against Mills College on the Mills campus. It was a game that went down to the wire, but near the end, Mills College forged ahead and won 28 to 18. 
Swimming, as usual before the war, had been one of the most popular sports at Stanford. The pool remained open throughout the winter so that the large number of women were able to receive instruction in aquatic arts. Mrs. Branston, whose husband was Ernie, the swimming coach from 1915 to 1947, developed new material and the team was inspired to break even their own records. A new record in the 100 yards was made with a time of one minute and 26 seconds. Tennis is one of the sports that could be played in every season. There was a lot of interest in playing tennis, although no off-campus competitions were held that year, many competitions were held within the classes on campus. The Antwerp Games were the sixth occurrence of the modern Olympics Games. The 1920 Olympics were awarded to Antwerp in the hopes of bringing the spirit of renewal to Belgium, which had been devastated during World War I. The defeated countries, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Turkey were not invited. Stanford put an amazing seven athletes on the United States Olympic track team in 1920 winning one gold, two silver, one bronze medal. Morris Kirksey led the way with one gold and one silver. John Norton won a silver, Feg Murray took home a bronze. Other track Olympians that year were Dink Templeton, Reg Carey, who we saw at the football, um, and others. Morris Kirksey, class of 1922, was the first Stanford athlete to win a gold medal from Stanford, as well as the first double winner in track and field and rugby. At the games, Kurtzy finished second in the 100 meter sprint. Six days later, he anchored the United States four by 100 meter relay team that won the gold medal in the world record time of 42.2 seconds. Two weeks later, Kurtzy won the second gold medal, helping um, the American rugby team defeat France eight to zero. That 1920 United States Olympic rugby team was comprised entirely of Northern California, Northern Californians. Players, there were pl six players from Cal, five from Santa Clara, nine players from Stanford, and two local club players. Other sports would start soon on the campus. Water polo started in 1920, Cross country started officially in 1921, gymnastics in 1922, fencing in 23, and golf in 1927. Today, 100 years later, we have a total national championships of 149, total NCAA championships of 123, 558 individual championships, and from that very first medal won by George Horn in the 19th by getting a bronze medal in the high jump to the first gold medal winner in 1920, we have now won 270 medals in the Olympics. I want to thank everybody for your attention, and I'll take any questions if there are any. Would you tell us a little about the construction of the old pavilion and Stanford Stadium? So that's my talk next year. <laughs> so I'm not going to give out any information beforehand. Uh, both those buildings were finished about 1921, the pavilion, the Stanford Pavilion it was, as it was known, and Stanford Stadium, and we'll, we are working on a talk for that. Ray, you mentioned the uh, gap where football was, re was replaced by rugby in 06 and then came back. I think this was a larger than Stanford issue, but could you tell us what happened to football in, the, in that decade? 
By the time 1905 came up, uh, the NCA, what was the precursor to the NCA, had started, and the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, got involved and realized that football was dangerous. And football was switched over really quickly at Stanford. It was still not switched to rugby in many of the sports, and especially out east, many of the eastern colleges were still playing football. So it wasn't a complete across the board cancellation of football, but Stanford was one of the, in the, on the forefront at that time, taking football away. And really only because of all the injuries. There were several deaths just that year before uh, in football, during practices and in games. Hi, Ray. <laughs> Great job. You mentioned a couple of different awards, um, block, block, Eight and circle called, something. What what were those awards? Yeah, so there was the the Block S award, which was for varsity uh, competition. You had to have so many at the time. It was a varsity letter. Yep, it was varsity letter. It was called the Block S award. And then there was the Circle S award that was later given to female athlete, uh, female athletes. It was the Circle S, but it was also given to the minor <laughs> sports. And then there was a Block numeral, a Block numeral eight. They called it, and that was for the minor sports. And if it was first class minor sport, they would get it if they won or lost. If it was a second class minor sport, they would only get the block numeral award if they won the competition. In the early 1920s, what would be the total budget for athletics? Do you have any idea, Ray? Yeah, I think uh, a little bit in the beginning, uh, we visited just a little bit about the, uh, the, all the income coming in that year was roughly $20 million. Or 20, I'm sorry, $20,000. <laughs> it was $20 million in 1994, I'll tell you that. The, um, so let me see if I have it right here. Um, it was um, $20,000 was the annual revenue that was coming in in 1919, 1920. That was their expected revenue. That would equate to about $433,000 today. No, everything I found was it was all the gate receipts took care of all the expenses for the athletic department. There was some student fees, and the student fees, the, everything the men paid in student fees went to the men's sports. Everything that the women paid in fees, half went to the men, half went to the women. <laughs> when did Stanford start uh, giving scholarships to athletes? Uh, that is a good question. Um, some of the things I read not directly with this is, although there were no scholarships in 1919, I think some of the players were actually paid to come. Uh, very little oversight with the, with the fledgling NCA, what was the NCA before that. Uh, scholarships, uh, that's a good question, and I'm not sure if anybody would know in this room. That's a good question. Uh, that could possibly be, yeah, scholarships. That's a good, that's a good question. Ray, can you repeat what she said? Um, get on tape. She said they may possibly in 1934 when the Buck Club started, and it was called the Buck of the Month Club. Yeah. Other questions? You want to get a mic? You want to get a microphone? In San Francisco, and the roof of the building next to the stadium collapsed and several people were killed. Uh, that was uh, at a big game in, in uh, San Francisco. Can you repeat the question? Oh, Sorry. The question was, talk a little bit about the incident where the roof collapsed. And that is an article that I think that was written a while back. And I don't know much about that. And uh, I apologize for not knowing about that. In fact, I haven't even read the article. So uh, when was the Pac-12 put together? And when did Stanford begin playing football games outside the conference? So Stanford's always, to my knowledge, played football games outside the conference. Uh, back then it was called the Pacific Coast Conference, and that evolved into the Pacific 8 Conference, which evolved into the Pac-10, Pacific 10 Conference, which then evolved into the Pac-12 Conference. Uh, but to my, everything I've read, we've always played outside the conference, either most of the time before the season started, uh, and then oftentimes during the season. 
If I remember, in 1930, Clemson University formed an athletic boosters club called I Pay 30 a Year, which came to be known by its acronym IPTE. Did that represent a model for the formation of the tiny buck of the month club here at Stanford, which I, if I remember was the actual original title of the club in 1934? Well, that is fascinating and it'd be fun to find out, but the, the tiny buck of the month club was literally that, a one your membership was $1 per month, $12 a year, and you were a member of the buck club. Microphone. I noticed uh, that golf started in 1921. When was the golf course here at Stanford built? And if not, where did they play that year? Uh, so they played most of the time up at the Olympic Club pre-1931. And in 1930, a guy named Alan Roth was instrumental in putting together some ideas for a golf course. There was, um, actually through the literature that I've read, there was pieces of a golf course on the campus, maybe just some practice pieces before 1931, and then the golf course was completed actually in the fall of 1930. The clubhouse was finished in 31, and that little pro shop building was finished in 31. <clears throat> 100 years ago, did they have the All-American designation? And if so, were any Stanford players an All-American? So in everything that I got to read for this, which was fascinating material, uh, not one mention of an All-American at Stanford. <laughs> no, I... I think we have time for a couple more questions. Well, I have a question about the first NCAA uh, championship. Was that the track team then that won Stanford's first NCAA title? You have your Wikipedia open, I see. <laughs> no, these are, I took notes on your... Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, but I'm curious, I mean, you said 25, 1928, 1934, Stanford track uh, and field. Yes, I would say that's probably so the, the first. Okay, yeah. thanks. I don't know for sure. When did Stanford first get their band? The Stanford band. Somebody's <laughs> going to have to help me with that question. Uh, I will say there was a photo that I did not include because I couldn't get a nice enough image of it, but in 1919, in Stanford Field, there was a neat picture of, a, of a, the Stanford band in 1919. So um, I should have added that to the talk. I think that would have been interesting. But I know the band was, there was a band there in 1919, according to the photo. I could add that there was a band going back to the very earliest days. And then it was 1963 when it became a non-military style band yeah. under Arthur P. Barnes. Well, thank you, everybody. I'll uh, stay around if you have any more questions.